Good to be here in Templeton again, and I'm a little shorter than Pastor Zach, so I'm going to lower this down here a little ways. Um, we uh, enjoyed the drive down and the uh, wonderful ho- hospitality of the Molders. We're enjoying that. And so we're, we're just excited to be here this weekend and spend some time talking about some um, exciting, hopefully not too controversial of topics, um, because I'll tell you what, my goal here is to... Uh, really just open God's Word together and ask some questions and, and look for principles in the Word of God that can guide us. Is that a good idea? And so um, I think as we do that, we may not agree on all of the applications of those all the time, but I think as God's people we can come together and say, you know what, our, our main goal is to, of course, know Jesus and spread his gospel, and we all want to make the world a better place, right? I want to tell you a story about an event that changed the course of history. I like stories that, you know, are pivotal moments in history. And this one is about something called the Lost Dispatch. Uh, You're probably familiar with um, this man right here, Robert E. Lee, the Confederate general. And around September 9, 1862, he issued a secret order. It was to go out to about five of his generals or so, and it was written down on some paper and and given to these these individual generals, and as soon as they read the order, most of them destroyed it right away. One of them chewed it up and spit it out or whatever, and another one burned his. But somehow, one general, we're not sure which one, uh, his orders ended up inside of a cigar box or an envelope with some cigars. And it was left behind on a battlefield. And as the Union Army was trailing the Confederate Army on their march up into Maryland, uh, a Union soldier just happened to look down and, you know, kicked the box at his feet, picked it up, oh, some cigars inside, and then he pulled out the piece of paper. And as he began to read, he thought, this is fascinating. What is this? Well, pretty soon he uh, showed it to his uh, commanding officer. Actually, here, here is a picture of the actual Uh, orders right there that are preserved, I believe, if you go to this particular battlefield there in Maryland at a farm near Frederick, Maryland, where this took place. And and, and his commanding officer thought, this looks legit, you know, let's, let's pass this up the ranks. Pretty soon it made it all the way up to General George McClellan. He was, of course, the commander of the the Union Army. And uh, when he got it, he began to read what Lee's plans were. Now, if you know anything about Robert E. Lee, Robert E. Lee was a rather ambitious and he was a risk taker, let's put it that way, right? Uh, And McClellan was just the opposite. He was very careful and kind of cautious. When he got the orders, McClellan said, now I know what to do. Um, He had gotten Robert Lee's secret orders and he knew now what uh, Lee was planning. And so, as the battle happened four days later, this famous battle of Antietam, um, the Union Army, of course, ended up prevailing. And years later, as historians look back on this event, some historians have said this is arguably uh, the event of the war, one that changed the tide in the Union's favor. In fact, it was one of the Union generals, or I'm sorry, the Confederate generals himself who said, um, it looks like the good Lord did not intend for us to win. And this event, this, this battle right here, was really that turning point in the war. I like reading about things that change the course of history, and of course, all history, not just one uh, nation's destiny, not just one battle, but all of human history was changed when Jesus Christ came down to this world. What does Paul tell us in the book of Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5? That God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. That is an event that changed history. Now, some of you might have watched um, Captain America. Anybody seen that one? The first Avenger? Don't raise your hand. It's okay. It's fiction, right? Um, 
But here it is. Steve Rogers, of course, played by Chris Evans, is just a puny little kid who wants to join the Army, right? World War II, this is the setting. He repeatedly fails the physicals, but he's finally recruited into a top-secret program, and they, they're going to inject him with this, this serum, right? That's going to make him into a Superman, essentially. So they strap him into the machine. They give him this super secret serum. And what happens? He becomes a super soldier. And it makes him significantly bigger and stronger. Suddenly he can do things that he couldn't do before. And as I was thinking about Jesus coming to this world, and somehow I thought about what happened there with Steve Rogers in that fictional story, I thought, you know, really, Jesus did just the opposite of that, right? This is a super God. This is the God of the universe who decides he is going to lay it all aside. He's going to go from superhero to a weak, frail, helpless human being. Crazy, isn't it? Crazy. In fact, what did Paul tell us? He said, who being in the very nature of God did not consider it equality with God, uh, equality with God, something to be grasped. But what did he do? He took upon himself the very nature of a slave. That's what the Greek says, right? Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Wow, what, what a history-changing event, right? Christ coming down to this world, becoming a man, laying aside his superpowers to become one of us. That's crazy. So how did he do it? That's the question we're asking tonight. And I want to share with you in the the Gospel of Luke, okay, Luke chapter 4, one of the times when Jesus announces his mission. Go to verse uh, 14. Now we as Adventists, of course, know Luke chapter 4, verse 16, quite well. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I assume some of you are, you're in an Adventist church here on a Friday night, um, what does that verse say? Right, it says, He came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Amen to that, right? Let's go to church on Sabbath. Let's, let's make that our custom too, just like Jesus. But, but there's more to this verse, because Jesus comes back home. Here he is. He's been gone for a while. He comes back home to you know, Nazareth, where he had grown up. The hometown kid is coming back. Everybody wants to hear him you know, talk. He's going to read the scripture that day. He's going to get up front. And so as he does, it so happens, or perhaps he selected it on purpose, he opens up to uh, the prophet Isaiah. And he reads these words. I think I have them on the screen here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because, Jesus says, and here he is, he's speaking his mission now. Uh, He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then it says he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And then, of course, In a moment, he stood up and said this, what? Today, this scripture from the prophet Isaiah is fulfilled in your hearing. As Jesus speaks these words, he was undoubtedly speaking um, about proclaiming spiritual riches, right, to the spiritually poor, about spiritual freedom for the prisoners of sin, about recovery of spiritual sight, right? All of those things, of course. And of course, that is the ultimate goal of Jesus, isn't it? To get us from this planet where we are uh, destined to die to heaven where we can live forever. That's his ultimate goal, isn't it? That should be ours as well. Um, Jesus did not come merely to save people from physical ailments or the ills of inj- or injustices of society, all right? He came to get us to heaven. And along these lines, Ellen White wrote these words in the book Desire of Ages. Look at this. She talked about how Jesus interacted with the government and political and social systems of his day. And I think it's important that we, we understand that his primary mission was not to reform those things, right? Here's what she said. The government under which Jesus lived was corrupt and oppressive. I mean, this is the Roman Empire, not, not very nice people, right? 
Yet the Savior attempted no civil reforms. He attacked no national abuses, nor condemned the national enemies. He did not interfere with the authority or administration of those in power. And you could make some good arguments for why he should have, perhaps, right? We're going to get into this in a minute. It's, it's, it's fascinating, right? And then he who was our example, she writes, kept aloof from earthly governments, not because he was indifferent to the woes of men, but because, here's a key point, the remedy did not lie merely in human and external measures to be efficient, the cure must reach men individually and must regenerate the heart. And so what she's saying there is that Jesus recognized that really what people need is not just a political solution, but a conversion of their heart, right? That's what we all, that's what we all need, isn't it? This is because God is about saving people, actually saving people from sin. Sin is the cause of the woes of humanity, and political solutions will never solve the problem of sin. Okay, so that's one side of the coin, I think we can say. And that is Jesus' mission. That ought to be our mission as well as the church. But did Jesus also address people's physical felt needs as well? Did he? He sure did. Um, Well, that was not perhaps his primary reason for coming to earth. He did proclaim good news to the poor and freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the actual physical blind, and, and even the oppressed were set free. There are many biblical examples. Jesus proclaimed good news to the literal poor. He proclaimed freedom to literal prisoners, including delivering his own disciples from prison at some point in the future, right? Giving sight to the literally blind, setting the literally oppressed free, including those like the woman caught in adultery who was going to be stoned. And he proclaimed the year of the Lord's favor. All of this, of course, not as ends in and of themselves, but with his primary mission in mind to save souls for eternity. And so some of you might be familiar with Nicholas Miller. Um, He's an Adventist historian, lawyer, taught at Andrews University, just recently left. But he wrote an article recently that was a really good one. And And he touched on this concept. And we just read this quote from Desire of Ages. And he, he comments on this. He says, those who quote this passage, the one we just read, as defining all Adventist involvement in public matters, overlook the context of the quote. This is Nick Miller's take. Okay? He, ta- he says it had to do with a movement that today we would call Christian dominionism. Believers who seek to establish a theocracy in this world. And by the way, tomorrow we'll talk a little bit more about kind of that concept, that, that relationship between church and state and We'll look at some different things, Um, so hopefully that will be something that that will be helpful. But he goes on to say, in describing Christ as keeping aloof from earthly governments, Ellen White was highlighting the spiritual mission of the church, but she was not purporting to set out Christians' role and duty as citizens of this world. Elsewhere, he says, she dealt with the topic of the Christians' role in public morality by word and action. In doing so, she revealed that the gospel and conversion would necessarily lead to the support a public justice, human equality, and social morality. All right, let's unpack some of that a little bit. So today we're talking about kingdom living in today's world, and the question tonight we're asking is this. If our citizenship is in heaven, you've read that Bible verse, right? That's where Paul says our citizenship is. How are we as Christians to relate to earthly politics? Should we unplug altogether and live maybe like the Amish do, you know? have our own communities, you know, kind of do things separate from everybody else. That's one option. Um, Or there are other options as well. Some folks in the Christian church are very involved in politics, right? Maybe even too much so, you could argue. What is the balance, and what does God want for us as his people? And I don't know that, you know, I have all the answers. I, I know I don't have all the answers, but I think we can find some things perhaps in the word of God. And um, Ellen White also brings some I think, really good principles to light that that could be helpful. I would suggest this. While the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, with eternal life as its reward, citizens of that kingdom on earth can't help but make a difference in the world as we pass through it. Would you agree? If we're here, and if we're going through this world, Jesus says, be salt, be light. 
And here's another thing that Jesus said in that same passage, or in that same um, sermon, I should say, in, in Matthew uh, chapter you know, 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said this. In this verse, when I was here a few months ago, um, I think I shared with you that this verse has been one that has been um, marinating, I guess you could say, in my mind for a long time. It's Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Here's what it says. So in everything, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. That's pretty profound, if you ask me. This is Jesus telling us a summary of what the Old Testament prophets have been telling us all along. He says, if you want to know what it's all about, this is it, the golden rule. Obviously, there's love God with all of your heart. That's the greatest commandment. But then he goes on to say, essentially, you know, here's this, this horizontal commandment. And, and, of course, John tells us that if we, really, if we don't learn how to love people, we can never really love God. Boy, that hit me because I grew up thinking that it was all about, you know, loving God, and, and I wasn't very nice to people around me, frankly. Um, some religious experiences don't really emphasize how we treat other people that much, but Jesus does. So this verse, as I was thinking about, as we think about this issue of um, how do we as citizens of the kingdom of heaven relate to the world around us, I think this verse really sums it up. If you want to just take one thing home tonight, take Matthew seven twelve home. That, that really sums it up to me. So, I'm going to share a few other things with you today. So going back to the 1800s, of course, the the early Seventh-day Adventists, they are living at a very tumultuous time in America's history. Talked about Robert E. Lee. They were living during that time, right? The early Adventist church was formed right around the time when the Civil War was uh, beginning. Um, And so right around this time, the general conference of the newly organized um, Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1865, right after Abraham Lincoln's assassination, they resolved, here's what they said, that in our judgment, the act of voting, these are Christians, these are Adventists, when exercised in behalf of justice, humanity, and right, is in itself blameless, they said, and may at some times be highly proper. Then they went on to talk about how it's not proper, though, to be involved in partisanship. In other words, saying, I'm with this party, and that's everything this party does is, is um, you know, I'm going to support, etc., etc. There's a fascinating story from the 1880s. This is, of course, now after the Civil War. But as you may know from American history, when the Civil War ended, uh, officially, some of those same battles, in a way, continued, at least in people's hearts and minds, right, that were happening during the Civil War. And so, um, in around the 1880s, uh, somebody had written an article, I think it was E.J. Wagoner, in the Review and Herald or the Signs of the Times, which is, of course, one of the Adventist Church publications. And this article had mentioned something about how we could help the formerly enslaved folks in the South, and it had mentioned some things in there about that. Well, somebody got offended by this article, And so they wrote a letter to Ellen White. Ellen White responded to this person, and we have her letter. Now, interestingly enough, the person who wrote this letter was a member of the Woodland Seventh-day Adventist Church, a little church up in Northern California that I actually, I've been to many times. I actually go there and speak probably about once a quarter because they they have a pastor who has multiple churches, so they invite guest speakers in. Lots of good people there. It's just fascinating that this, this happened in a little church that you can visit today, right? I think it's a different building, though, but anyway. So she writes this letter to this guy, and and this article, of course, again, had been about, you know, the oppression of of, uh, of blacks in the South, you know, during the era of what we call Jim Crow at this point, right? And here's what she said to this guy. She said, listen, if our pens and voices are to be silent when principles of justice and righteousness, okay, by the way, keep some words in mind here. Justice, righteousness, you're going to see that popping up here, I think, as we talk about these topics. And warnings or reproofs are at stake because some one or ones, believers or unbelievers, are so sensitive, bigoted, and prejudiced that their peculiar political sentiments cannot be in any manner referred to. That class will have to be thoroughly converted to God, their sentiments reformed. Now, 
If we had read her Desire of Ages statement and stopped right there, we might think, man, why is she even addressing this at all, right? Aren't we supposed to remain out of political issues altogether? Well, the early Adventists actually got involved in talking about some political issues, and we're going to look at some principles that will kind of guide us on when we should and when we shouldn't, I think. Ellen White then went on to specifically refer to Isaiah chapter 61. The very verse that Jesus, when he stood up there in that synagogue at Nazareth, had quoted from. Okay? She goes on to talk about that. She says, why don't you cut out of your Bibles then when Christ refers to his work? And she quotes this verse. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach you know, the good news to the poor, etc., etc. Right? So Ellen White takes this verse that Jesus said was his mission, and she applies it to, interestingly enough, a social and, yes, political situation in 19th century America. Interesting, right? And she basically tells this gentleman, hey, buddy, you need to be converted because your issue ought to be with Jesus and not with the guy who wrote this article, essentially, because we need to be talking about issues of what? Justice and righteousness. So, in light of that, let's, let's explore some biblical principles that can guide us, right, as we figure out which political issues are issues of justice and righteousness. Which ones should we as Christians be concerned with, and which ones should we honestly be silent about? Because perhaps there are some things that we ought to just not be as Christians be involved with, right? So, um, let me see here. I'm going to share with you some principles. Now, these are by no means exhaustive. They're, I'm sure you could, if you have others you'd like to share with me, I would love to hear it when we're finished here today. But so just a few that have popped out at me as I have studied the Word of God. I'm going to share, share some Scripture and uh, other references to, um, to, uh, as to why I've come to these. Principle number one, Christians should avoid dabbling in partisan politics. And Ellen White, as you read her writings and the early Adventists, they made a distinction between politics when it came to issues of justice and righteousness and partisan politics. In other words, saying, um, I'm going to, again, support a party platform all the way across, and I'm, I'm of this political party, and I just do things and vote for them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we should avoid dabbling in partisan politics and expressing mere political preferences when doing so does not promote justice and righteousness and only creates unnecessary division. Here are some Bible verses that I think actually lead me to that, uh, that conclusion. Here's what Paul said. Watch out for people who cause what? I mean, okay, if we want to talk about how to create divisions, just bring up politics, right? <laughs> At potluck. <laughs> or don't, right? But anyway, if you want to, that's, that's what you need to do. You know, because it's a, these are divisive issues, and there is a time. Jesus talked about, I came to bring right? Uh, a sword, right? But if it's not an issue of justice and righteousness, should we be dividing the church over political issues? I don't think so. Paul went on to say, these divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you've been taught. Stay away from people like that. People like that are not serving Jesus. They're serving their own personal interests, etc. Here's another one, 1 Corinthians 3. You were jealous of one another. You quarrel with one another. Uh, doesn't that prove you're controlled by your sinful nature? When one of you says, I'm a follower of, now, this was, these were religious leaders, right? But could we do the same with political leaders? I'm of this political persuasion, I'm of this political persuasion. He says, aren't you just acting like people of the world? So don't boast about following a particular human leader. Okay, so that's, that's not me. That's the Bible telling us that, right? Don't boast about following a particular human leader leader. Ella White, she writes these words, and she, I think she's on to something here. She says, we cannot with safety vote for political parties. What she means is, you know, taking a whole, you know, political party's slate of candidates, perhaps, or positions, for we do not know whom we are voting for. We cannot with safety take part in any political scheme. We cannot labor to please men who will use their influence to repress religious liberty and set out, uh, set in operation oppressive measures to lead or compel their fellow men to keep Sunday as the Sabbath. Of course, that was a big issue that she was concerned about was 
uh, Sunday laws. And um, that was something actually happening right then. You could you know, argue it's going to happen again, right? But the issue is this. She says, be careful. You don't know what you're voting for if you're going to you know, remain loyal to one political party um, no matter what. And then she writes this. The Lord would have his people bury political questions. On these themes, silence is eloquence. But you notice that she wrote a letter herself telling somebody who was criticizing the signs of the times for publishing an article that they deemed political. She says, listen, we need to speak out about issues of what? Justice and righteousness that might also be considered political. So we have to take all of these statements and I think kind of um, uh, harmonize them as we look at the principles involved here. Okay, that's principle number one. Principle number two. This is a controversial one, believe it or not. Christians should love and pray for their enemies. Do you believe that? Do you think we even ought to pray for our political enemies? I mean, sometimes we give ourselves a pass because those politicians are obviously too far gone, right? They are evil. They know what they're doing. Well, that may be so, but God still calls us to pray for our enemies and to even pray for those we may believe are too far gone. After all, didn't Nebuchadnezzar give his heart to Jesus? the man who destroyed Jerusalem itself. He wrote a chapter of our Bibles, right? Um, I don't think anyone's beyond hope. Jesus' words, I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And then I, I comment here, keep in mind that to love one's enemies does not contradict God's command, though, to actually speak the truth, right? To shout it out, declare to my people their rebellion, or to stand up against those same enemies to defend the rights of the poor and the needy. So loving does not mean passivity, right? It doesn't mean timidity necessarily either. Um, but it means respect, and it means our willingness to actually lay down our lives so that those people can be saved. I really believe this is a important issue for the last days. We talk about the character of Christ being reproduced in his people. I don't know about you, but I find the most difficult thing in my life to live out that golden rule, because I'm naturally selfish. And I really feel like the, the ultimate test of our love for other people is when we love our enemies, or we don't, right? And so Jesus calls us to love our enemies. He calls us to enter into his character, and remember, that Jesus died for us when we were his enemies too. Principle number three. We should avoid condemning individuals, even politicians that we dislike, yet we may be called to speak truth to power. Now, I'm not talking about uh, condemning perhaps positions or um, ideas or, um, you know, things that these politicians are doing, but I'm talking about the individuals themselves. Does God call us to love all people? D d again, going back to this idea that God can even work for a Nebuchadnezzar's salvation, God, I believe, does not call us to condemn people. Yet we may be called to speak truth to power just like John the Baptist did. Paul says this, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. I don't see exceptions there, do you? so that you may know how to answer everyone. Ellen White writes these words. She says, The less we make direct charges against authorities and powers, the greater work we shall be able to accomplish. If we wish men to be convinced that the truth we believe sanctifies the soul and transforms the character, let us not be continually charging them with vehement accusations. In this way, we shall force them to the conclusion that the doctrine we profess cannot be the Christian doctrine, since it does not make us kind, courteous, and respectful. Christianity is not manifested in pugilistic accusations and condemnation. Like John the Baptist who rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, that was not a popular thing to do or to say, right? Uh, and all the other evil things he had done. We may be called to actually say things that are controversial, right, and unpleasant, but we will do it in love. And again, even the pagan king gave his heart to God. Principle number four. Christians may be able to legitimately 
assert their civil rights. Romans chapter 13, of course, and other Bible verses tell us that Christians are called to submit to earthly governments to the extent that the laws of the land do not violate God's laws, right? And Peter, of course, tells us that we are called to suffer persecution quietly, but there is nothing wrong with Christians asserting their civil right when it glorifies God and promotes justice for the oppressed. Here's an example. Paul and Silas asserted their civil rights under Roman law and insisted that the political leaders who had unjustly imprisoned them uh, publicly support them. You recall that story, right? Here they are in Philippi, and he tells the, um, uh, the magistrates, listen, you have unjustly whipped us as Roman citizens, and you need to escort us publicly out of town. And so he asserted his civil rights, right? Um, and also, there was another time where he, of course, stood up and said, I appeal to Caesar, and he was sent to Rome. So Paul did this, and Christians may even be called to exercise civil disobedience when a law violates God's law. Of course, that's Acts 5.29, where Peter and John and the other disciples stood up and said, we must obey God rather than men, if there's a conflict between the two. So I think there is a time for Christians to assert their civil rights. You know, as an attorney, um, I do some work with the Church State Council, which is our Pacific Union's uh, religious liberty ministry. And one of the things that that the Church State Council does is support um, Adventist church members as well as other Christians who have religious conflicts in the workplace. If someone wants to uh, observe their holy day, Sabbath, or will even help Sunday keepers, um, and the employer refuses to accommodate them, we will help them to, you know, if necessary, file a lawsuit. Um, and, and some people question, is that what Christians should do? And I think that it, it depends, is the answer, right? If we're doing it with an attitude of anger, of, uh, of retaliation, I don't think that probably glorifies God. I've represented, I remember one client I had who we found out down the road in the process he wasn't telling the truth completely. And that was embarrassing. I thought, this is not good. I'm representing the Adventist church and this man against a large employer. Um, it didn't look good. But if, if someone's a good employee and their employer is, is being unreasonable and they're not letting them observe the Sabbath, for example, um, I think there's a time and a place where if that's available, if those laws are there, um, Christians ought to be able if we do it in a Christ-like manner, to assert our civil rights. All right, principle number five. These are some principles, hopefully, to guide us as we think about how we can uh, interact with our world on a political level. Christians, I believe, have a moral responsibility to use their voice and vote to advocate for, what were the words Ellen White used? Justice and righteousness on behalf of the oppressed even when doing so may involve political engagement. Here's what the Bible says about that. Proverbs chapter 31. Speak up for those who what? Cannot speak for themselves. For the rights of all who are destitute, speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. This is one of many Bible verses that teach this principle of speaking up for people who don't have as much power as you do. And when I say power, I mean maybe influence. Maybe it's money, maybe it's time, maybe you have education, maybe you have intelligence, maybe you have something that someone else doesn't have. That's power. You can use that to help others, right? Here's some examples. Remember that story about Abraham? His nephew Lot had moved out. He finds out later that some kings had come and um, captured the people of Sodom and Gomorrah as well as Lot, and they'd taken them off. Remember that? Abraham gets his servants together, they go out as an army, and they rescue Lot and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and everybody else, right? Um, I think that's an interesting example. Ellen White has some interesting things to say about that, by the way, in the book Patriarchs and Prophets. Um, the Hebrew midwives. These are advocates for justice in the Bible. Do you recall what, was, what the law said that they had to do? Kill all the male babies. If you see a male baby, kill it. What did they do? They're like, we're going to civilly disobey. We're going to exercise 
well, it wasn't really a civil right. We're going to just disobey, right? And they did. Was that the right thing to do? Um, oh, yeah. Moses is a leader of Israel. Um, definitely, as he led the Israelites out of Egypt, out of oppression, was he advocating for justice? Was he actually doing something for justice? Absolutely, right? Uh, Mordecai and Esther. Boy, I mean, Esther was talking about an advocate. She's going in before the king, risking her life to uh, try to save God's people. Mordecai does as well. In fact, interestingly enough, after you know Haman was uh, dispatched with, um, who became the prime minister? It was Mordecai. And another law was, was enacted that uh, basically allowed the Hebrews to be able to defend themselves against this unjust law. Fascinating stories in the Bible, right? How do we apply these today? These are things we would have to grapple with, right? The Hebrew prophets were definitely advocates for justice. I mean, you read the minor prophets, as we call them especially, and they are very vocal about standing up for the poor and the needy and the oppressed in their day. I would, I would include Jesus in this group an advocate for justice. Now, there's a balance here. We read what Ellen White said about Jesus not attempting civil reforms and so on and so forth. That is a very important thing to remember. We also have to remember that Jesus actually did make a difference in the world around him, though, right? How do we apply that today? These are the things that we're grappling with. What about the end-time church? So, I think, if you read Isaiah chapter 58... A lot of times, by the way, as Adventists, we read Isaiah 58, and what comes to your mind uh, first off when you think of Isaiah 58, perhaps? Maybe verses 12 through 14, right? The verses about the Sabbath, powerful verses, beautiful verses. And I see a connection between all of Isaiah 58, not just the last three verses there, and Revelation chapter 14. That's a whole other Bible study we could get into sometime. But I see that uh, God's end time people will be involved in making the world a better place for those who are less fortunate than themselves. I'm going to share with you a couple of examples here. Boy, these are, these are a bit controversial. They were in Ellen White's day, at least. Because Ellen White, here she is, she's applying some of this now. Let's, let's do this. Let's do a case study, political views that clash with biblical values. So Ellen White writes now. She's writing in her capacity as a church leader. If you believe that she was inspired by God as a messenger of the Lord, then she's writing in that capacity as well. And she's writing about a very hot-button political issue at her time, right? The Civil War, uh, the issue of slavery. That was a political issue, right? But let me ask you a question. Was the issue of slavery also a, an issue of justice and righteousness? Yes? Absolutely. That's why she was interested. She wasn't interested in talking about monetary policy necessarily, you know, uh, or about, uh, I don't know, you could name what, what color they were going to paint the, you know, uh, court building down the street or whatever, if they were going to pave the roads. She was interested in issues that had to do with justice and righteousness. And so here's what she wrote about this issue. This is a case study here. God is punishing the North, okay, Northern United States, that they have so long suffered the accursed sin of slavery, she called it, to exist. For in the sight of heaven, it is a sin of the darkest dye. God is not with the South, and he will punish them dreadfully in the end. Satan is the instigator of all rebellion. Those are some pretty strong words, right? She goes on to say this, to a brother, brother A, I hope it wasn't brother Allred, I don't know how they name these people here, um, she said, I, I saw that you, Brother Allred, Brother A, sorry, not Brother Allred, have permitted your political principles to destroy your judgment and your love for the truth. So she's writing to an individual, and she is essentially telling him, your politics have skewed your views of what is right and wrong. We don't want to let that happen, do we? I have had time, I, I've actually seen that happen in my own life, and I've had to um, change course a couple times in my life. I don't know about you. There have been a couple times I realized, you know, wait, wait a minute, I'm going down the wrong road here, and I'm being influenced more by what I'm listening to over here than what I'm reading in the Word of God. I don't want that to happen. So she writes to this guy. She says, listen, you've permitted your political principles to destroy your judgment, your love for the truth. They're eating out true godliness from your heart, 
And then she goes to say, you have never looked upon slavery in the right light, and your views of this matter have thrown you on the side of the rebellion, which was stirred up by Satan and his host. Your views of slavery cannot harmonize with the sacred important truths of this time. You must yield your views or the truth. We must let it be known that we have no such ones, talking about sympathizers with, with slavery in the Confederacy, in our fellowship that we will not walk with them in church capacity. I mean, those are strong words. She's writing to this Adventist church member and saying, listen, you can't be an Adventist and have the political views that you have. Wow, right? Um, and so here's the question, I guess, as I'm, we're talking about all these different principles and we're trying to put them together and apply them in our lives. How do we, you know, uh, essentially, the question is, avoid the non-essential uh, political fighting. We don't want that in the church. We don't want to bring division to the church. And yet, God calls his people to be advocates of justice and righteousness, even on a horizontal political level. Would you agree? Let me take you to another quote here, talking about this case study. Here's another one, the temperance cause in voting. So, of course, the temperance cause was the prohibition of alcohol, and uh, early Adventists were very much involved in this issue, as well as the abolition of slavery. By the way, tomorrow morning, we will talk more about this in a little more depth, both of these issues, but um, uh, they were advocating for, uh, to make liquor, sale, production, transport, etc., illegal in the United States. Well, that's a little bit controversial, wouldn't you agree? Uh, also a bit intrusive, would you not agree? Telling somebody what they can and cannot drink? Right? Am I, am I wrong? I don't know if, you know, it, it's, to me it seems a little bit, you know. But, but to them, they said, hey, listen, this is a moral issue. And it's also, they, I, can, I think they viewed it, if you read Francis Nickel, who was an Adventist Review editor for a long time, he, they viewed it as a public health issue because they said, listen, if people uh, are drinking a lot, they're going to beat their wives and husbands up. They're going to have, I guess, buggy and carriage accidents or whatever. You know, I mean, essentially, Things aren't good if you've got alcohol everywhere, right? So they were very strong advocates of the temperance cause. And, of course, they succeeded for a while, right? We, they passed the um, amendment that outlawed alcohol in America, the sale of it. But uh, she goes on to say this, well, we are in no wise to become involved in political questions. All right, here's the disclaimer at the beginning of her quote, right? Don't get involved in politics, yet... It is our privilege to take our stand decidedly on all questions relating to temperance reform. And then you could also add, and other issues of justice and righteousness, including the cause of abolition of slavery, and we'll talk about a couple others tomorrow. Every individual, she goes on to say, exerts an influence in society. In our favored land, every voter has some voice in determining what laws shall control the nation. Should not that influence and that vote be cast on the side of temperance, and virtue. And then she goes on to say, basically, you can't expect God to just work a miracle in the world when you're not willing to do anything about it. So get out and vote. That's what she was saying. Fascinating, right? Don't get involved in politics unless it has to do with issues of justice and righteousness. That's what she's kind of saying, right? So I think many of us understand this last principle. You know, she was concerned with the issue of temperance reform. And yet, we can remove the word temperance and I think insert any other issue that has to do with justice and righteousness. And the same counsel could apply today. I want to read something to you from Douglas Morgan. He is an Adventist historian who teaches at Washington Adventist University, I believe. And... He wrote an, he's written some excellent articles. One of them, I want to just quote a little bit from you, or from that article and, and share it with you today. He says this, Ellen White did not believe that Christians should be involved in using politics as an instrument of power and control. But she did believe that Christians are justified in being involved in politics as a means of exposing tyranny and political iniquity, speaking out with forceful clarity on issues of justice and mercy. And he says this, two guideposts from Ellen White's counsel thus come into sharper focus. First, those who speak under the banner of the church cannot dabble in politics. The church's message and mission require a free agency under God that must not be compromised or corrupted by entanglements with political parties 
or other partisan interests. So first of all, let's not get caught up, he says, as the church, it, with political parties and saying we're with this group, we're with that group, whatever. Okay? Secondly, Christians should not be silent about injustice, exploitation, and inhumanity, even if advocacy for legislative or public policy changes stirs political opposition. In other words, when we get involved with issues of justice and righteousness, it might be controversial. And yes, it might get us involved in politics, but that's what Jesus would want us to do. I go back to Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. If you want to take one thing away tonight, let it be this. How do we live as Christians in this world? Citizens of heaven, sojourners through this world. Jesus said, so then in everything, what? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Because this sums up the law and the prophets, what it's all about. I want to leave you with a quotation here. And I want to tell you a story. This is also written by Ellen White, the book Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. She wrote these words. This is probably one of my favorite uh, quotations on this topic from her writing. She says, the standard of the golden rule is the true standard of Christianity. If you want to know what it's all about, this is, this is where it's at, that do unto others. Anything short of it is a deception, a religion, then she goes on to say, that leads men to place a low estimate upon human beings whom Christ has esteemed of such value as to give himself for them. A religion that will lead us to be careless of human needs, sufferings, or rights. See, this is where they got involved in the temperance work, in the abolitionism, and all this other stuff, is a spurious religion. That's a false religion, right? In sliding the claims of the poor, the suffering, and the sinful, we are proving ourselves traitors to Christ. Now, this is strong language. I read this, and I was like, whoa, crazy. And then, ah, this is powerful. Search heaven and earth. And there is no truth revealed more powerful than that which is made manifest in works of mercy to those who need our sympathy and aid. This is the truth as it is in Jesus. When those who profess the name of Christ shall practice the principles of the golden rule, the same power will attend the gospel as in apostolic times. Does that give you goosebumps? Jesus, by the way, shows us this kind of love and mercy as he stretched out his hands on that Roman cross beam. And he, as he was being nailed to the cross, he prayed what? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Reminds me of Corey Ten Boom. You know who she was, don't you? She had experienced the love of Jesus, and yet it wasn't easy for her to forgive her Nazi persecutors. Um, man, they tormented her at Ravensbrück. They would caused her to suffer horribly. Even worse, they had caused the death of her sister, Betsy. So here she was, 10 years, 10 years later, she runs into a lady who wouldn't look her in the eye. She thought, wait, I recognize her. What? That face is familiar. You know, you've run into people like, they're like, who, who is that person? Asking about her, Corey uh, found out that she had been a nurse at a concentration camp. Suddenly, Corey's memories just flooded her mind. She recalled taking Betsy to the infirmary to see this woman. Betsy's feet had been paralyzed, um, and she was dying, and this nurse had been cruel and sharp-tongued and treated her sister terribly. Carrie's hatred. Ten years later now, it returned with a vengeance. Her rage was so just great that she knew of but one thing to do. And so she cried out to God, God, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive my hatred, Lord. Teach me to love my enemies. And then she said the blood of Jesus suddenly seemed to cool her embittered heart. She felt the rage being displaced by a divine love she couldn't explain. She began praying for this woman. And, and one day, shortly afterwards, she called the hospital where this nurse worked and invited the woman to a meeting at which she was speaking. And the nurse was shocked. What? You, you, want to, you want me to come? Yes, that's why I called you. Well, then I'll come. And so that evening, the nurse came, and she listened to Corey's talk. 
And afterward, Corey sat down with her. She opened her Bible and explained 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. And this nurse seemed to thirst for Corey's quiet and confident words about God's love for us, His enemies. And the story goes that that night, a former captive led her former captor to a decision that made the angels sing. God had taken Corey's subconscious feelings of hatred, she later said, and transformed them, using them as a window through which his light could shine into a darkened heart. Our world today needs Christians like that, who will speak up, yes, for the oppressed, stand up for the right, yes. But the world has a lot of loud voices out there, if you've been listening. A lot of opinions, right? Some of them are good, some of them are bad. But I think what the difference is for us as Christians is that we come with those opinions, with those voices, with an attitude of love. Even love for our enemies, even love for our opponents, the ones that we disagree with. What the world especially needs right now is love. People that will love others, especially their enemies. It takes me back to that, that last part of that quote we just read right there. When those who profess the name of Christ shall practice the do unto other principle, right? Then what will happen? The same power. That's Holy Spirit power. That's the power of love, really, God's love, will attend the gospel as an apostol- apostolic times. Do you want to see that today? I do. Let's pray. Jesus, let let, it, let that happen today, right? Let's just pray. Raise your hand up if that's your desire. Say, God, I want the Holy Spirit to love through me like that. Father in heaven, you see our hands tonight. You sent your son to this world. You gave him up for us so that we could live. You did it while we were yet enemies, Paul tells us. And tonight, Lord, something about that just inspires us. We want to love just a little bit like that. We're not good at it. We don't do it well. But we're opening up our hearts to you tonight. Because, God, we recognize that we as a church have a special place in this world. As we are on our way through this land to the heavenly Canaan, you've given us a mission. It's a mission to share the gospel, the eternal gospel, and along the way to make this world a better place and people's lives better as well. And so, Lord, teach us how that looks in our lives. Teach us how we should interact with this world as we walk through. But most of all, just infuse our hearts with that love, that supernatural love that that only comes from you, God, so that we can love the world around us like you do. That's my prayer tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.